Hello, everyone. I am uh, Raymond Lada. I am the uh, spokesperson for Revolution Books here in Harlem, and um, I am an advocate for the new communism uh, developed by the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian. Um, very excited to be having this program today. And um, the title of my talk is The Big Problem with Netflix Three-Body Problem, Anti-Communist Distortion and Fatalism in a World that Cries Out for the New Communist Revolution. Now, some of you may know about this science fiction series and may be watching it. Some of you may not be that familiar with it, but all of you need to know two things. First, this show is a major cultural phenomenon. It's watched and being watched by millions of people around the world. Second, through the medium of storytelling, it is a major ideological assault on communism, on Mao Zedong, who is the greatest revolutionary of the 20th century, and on the Cultural Revolution led by Mao during the years 1966 to 1976. That Cultural Revolution was an overwhelmingly liberatory and unprecedented episode in the history of communist revolution, indeed in the history of world humanity. Now, I realize that's a mouthful, uh, and I'm going to break this down in my talk. But I wanted to be clear that the reason I'm giving this talk is that the stakes are high. Look, we face a dire state of emergency. Genocide in Gaza. Women stripped of the right to abortion, fascism on a rampage, the climate crisis careening towards catastrophe, and the growing danger of world war, of nuclear war. This is an existential crisis that humanity faces. And the system we live under, the system that rules over you and all of us, capitalism, imperialism is the cause of this with the U.S. the number one oppressor and plunderer in the world. But there is a way out of this horror, a revolution guided by the new communism developed by the revolutionary leader Bob Avakian, a revolution to emancipate humanity and protect the planet, a revolution to change everything. This revolution is not only so badly needed, it is also more possible with the rulers at each other's throats and society being torn apart. Yet no sooner do you hear the word communism that you start thinking, hmm, isn't communism, isn't it long dead, something that everyone knows is a failure? Isn't it a system of mass control mass conformity and senseless violence that promises a paradise but leads inevitably to nightmare? Well, that's not what you independently think and know. It's what you've been trained to think and know, what's been drilled into your head by this system, by this capitalist imperialist system, by its experts and ideologues, through its media and highly promoted memoirs, all telling you, warning you, that you cannot get beyond capitalism, that if you try, it'll be a disaster. Long live selfishness, exploitation, and greed. <laughs> this is the anti-communist brainwash you're getting. It seeps into every poor of political, intellectual, and cultural life, keeping you ideologically locked into this system in ways you're not even aware of. 
Which brings us to Exhibit A, the Netflix series Three-Body Problem that began streaming in late March. It's a science fiction story based on a highly, highly popular contemporary Chinese novel. The Netflix adaptation, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, this Netflix adaptation introduces you to several young scientists in astrophysics and nanotechnology working in London. Their sophisticated research centers are receiving nonsensical results that overturn a decade of carefully collected data. And around the same time, a number of scientists have committed suicide for no apparent reason. Other strange things happen, like the stars one night getting brighter and then flickering on and off. Apparently, an outer worldly force is trying to get humanity's attention. There's a lot of spectacle in this series put together by the creators of Game of Thrones. But what I'm focusing on here, and what is key to the storyline, setting it in motion, and an ongoing theme, is the Cultural Revolution in China. Not the Cultural Revolution as it really was in its main and overwhelmingly positive and profoundly liberatory aspect, but a vicious anti-communist misrepresentation that not only serves as a thematic anchor of this series, but reinforces the official bourgeois narrative of the Cultural Revolution as an exercise in chaos and mass terror. The opening scene of Three Body Problem takes place on an outdoor stage emblazoned with revolutionary banners. An astrophysicist is forcibly seated at the center, hounded by young followers of Mao. They are accusing him of subscribing to bourgeois and imperialist science, Einstein and the theory of relativity and the theory of the Big Bang about the start of the universe in its present configuration. He is told that he must recant because the Big Bang explanation is said to allow for the existence of God. He refuses. The physicist's wife then denounces him. His interrogators grow more violent and beat him repeatedly. The assembled crowd cheers all this on. The physicist's daughter, herself a brilliant physicist, um, is in that crowd. And she watches in horror as her father is tormented and killed on that stage. She becomes a central figure in this saga. And to protect herself from prison and worse, and this too is a vicious caricature of the cultural revolution as a massive lockup, she agrees to become part of a top secret scientific project in Maoist China. Researchers working for the government are working on sending signals to extraterrestrial species. And in taking up this post in this remote region of China, she witnesses what the film falsely portrays as a Maoist war on nature in order to develop the economy. And you see forests being destroyed and destroyed. She assumes major research responsibility in this secret government project, and she ultimately makes contact with extraterrestrials, and then makes a fateful decision that invites an alien invasion to colonize the Earth. Why? to save humanity from its destructive impulses, the worst of which were in full display during the Cultural Revolution. This is the fatalism of three-body problem. There is no hope for humanity. 
you, the viewer, are left with this bogus and lurid picture of the Cultural Revolution as a decade-long campaign of fanatical mob violence, as as anti-intellectual and anti-science, as utterly heedless toward the environment. Taking this film as a source of knowledge about the Cultural Revolution would be equivalent to trying to understand the U.S. Civil War and the radical period of Reconstruction following the Civil War, it would be equivalent to gaining that knowledge according to the racist film, Birth of a Nation, which utterly distorts those events as the unmitigated horror of freed slaves wreaking havoc on society. Now, I am a follower of the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, and over the last four decades and more, he has developed the new communism. He has summed up the experience of the first stage of communist revolution, the Russian Revolution of 1917, 1956, and the Chinese Revolution of 1949 to 1976. He has drawn from diverse spheres of human endeavor and understanding and analyzed great changes that have taken place in the world. Now, there are different dimensions to this new communism. But at its core is the search for the truth, a consistently and thoroughly scientific method and approach to reality, which means engaging reality with all of reality, learning from all spheres of life, fostering intellectual and cultural ferment, learning, yes, from diverse political and ideological streams and perspectives, even those opposed to socialism, but that may be getting at important truths about society and the world. Avakian has put it provocatively, all truths will help us get to communism. All truths will help us get to communism, to a world without exploitation and oppression, to a world community of humanity no longer divided into classes and riven by antagonistic social conflict. All truths will help us get to communism, even truths about the experience of socialist revolution that make us cringe. Truth is objective, what corresponds to reality. And getting at the truth requires identifying the main and defining features, the main and defining features and trends of a given phenomenon so that we can understand and evaluate it. The point of this scientific approach to understanding reality in the fullest and deepest possible ways is to transform reality in the most profound and revolutionary way. Now, getting at the truth of the cultural revolution means recognizing its liberatory aims, methods, and achievements, but also its shortcomings and problems, even quite serious ones. And being thoroughly truthful and evidence-based requires asking and investigating whether there might be some truth to the portrayal in three-body problem of how struggle was conducted during the Cultural Revolution? And is there anything to its depiction of the ways certain scientific theories were received and assessed during the Cultural Revolution? Even a grain of truth in a sea of lies about the Cultural Revolution because the new communism demands this of us. It has everything to do with how, on the basis of this new communism, we can make a qualitatively more emancipating revolution in today's world. Now, I mentioned the first stage of communist revolution, the Russian Revolution of 1917, 1956, and the Chinese Revolution of 1949 to 1976. These were the first 
and historic attempts to create societies free from exploitation and oppression. And they accomplished incredibly inspiring things against enormous odds. They faced unremitting pressure and threat from imperialism, including in the case of the Soviet Union in the 1940s, a massive genocidal onslaught by German imperialism. And within a year of the victory of the Chinese Revolution in 1949, the U.S. imperialists were moving up the Korean Peninsula and threatening nuclear strikes against China. But for all these difficulties and challenges, the first stage of communist revolution opened, as I said, a whole new chapter in human history. The Soviet Union and revolutionary China created the world's first planned socialist economies that served the needs of the people, not the enrichment of the few based on exploitation. These revolutions took the emancipation of women as a fundamental point of orientation. It, in the case of Mao and the Cultural Revolution, society was sprung into the air and revolutionized in ways unheard of in human history. The formerly oppressed and exploited were empowered to take ever greater responsibility for the direction of society. But these revolutions were also constrained by problems in the method and approach guiding them. The new communism, while upholding and building on this first stage of communist revolution, also ruptures in important ways with aspects of previous communist theory and practice. Importantly, it decisively breaks with the poisonous notion that the ends justifies the means. And this has infected the communist movement. What the new communism emphasizes and teaches is that the means and methods of revolution must flow from and serve the goal of getting to a world without exploitation and oppression. Now, with this as a foundation, I want to turn to the Cultural Revolution, to its historical backdrop and lessons. In 1949, the Chinese Revolution, mobilizing tens of millions of people under Mao's leadership, came to power. It drove out foreign imperialism. It shattered the old oppressive economic and social order in which landlords despotically ruled over hundreds of millions of peasants in the countryside and a corrupt Capitalism led to horrific exploitation and destitution in the cities. The revolution put an end to that. It carried out the most extensive land reform in history. It established a new socialist state power, a new socialist economy, geared to meeting basic needs. Under Mao's leadership, the revolution forged new liberatory institutions and new cooperative and collective ways of solving problems, new cooperative and collective relations among people. It carried out literacy and health campaigns and waged struggle against deeply entrenched subordination of women. Listen to this. In 1949, in a country of 500 million people, there are only 12,000 doctors trained in modern medicine. By 1965, there were over 200,000. But even as the revolution progressed, Mao analyzed that China was still a society marked by social inequalities and differences. For instance, there still existed a wide gap between the economic social conditions in the countryside, where the vast majority of people lived, and the higher development in the cities. There was still a division of labor in society where the majority of people were mainly engaged in manual labor, working with their hands, while a minority was mainly engaged 
in the realm of ideas and administrative activity. There were still differences in income, and it was still necessary to use money. These things can't be eliminated overnight in socialist society, but they must be restricted and transformed to get to a world without exploitation and oppression and class division. And at the same time, there are vestiges in socialist society of the culture, the ways of thinking, and the values of the old society that carry over, and they too must be transformed. Mao went further. He analyzed that these inequalities and social differences generate new privileged forces, including a new bourgeois capitalist class within socialist society. And the power center of this new capitalist class is within the top levels of the Communist Party and the highest levels of the socialist state. Why? Because the Communist Party, which is essential to the advance of the revolution, to making this revolution, because the Communist Party is the leading political institution in socialist society, and the socialist economy, the socialist state economy, is the heart of the economic system. Now, these new privileged forces, these capitalist rotors, as Mao described them, aim to take China down the capitalist road. Now, these capitalist rotors were not there parading with property deeds and with a call for a stock exchange. They were advocating policies and programs in the name of socialism that would Bring back capitalism. Mao and the revolutionary forces represented and fought for the socialist road to deepen and carry forward the revolution to overcome these inequalities and differences while the capitalist rotors were seeking to widen those social and economic differences and privileges. But the capitalist rotors had tremendous strength and influence in the Communist Party at the highest levels of government and in the military. They pushed a program of putting the economy on a profit-based footing, of telling workers to keep their noses to the grindstone, never mind the larger issues of society and the world, this in the name of creating a more efficient, socialism that would raise their living standards. These capitalist rotors fought to put the educational system on an ever more elitist foundation in the name of creating an expert-based socialist society. And they implemented these kinds of policies where they had sufficient control and influence. And by 1965, they had positioned themselves and were, and were maneuvering to seize power in society as a whole. This was the real world backdrop of the Cultural Revolution launched by Mao in 1966. You never will hear that from all this anti-communist brainwash that you get. What was this Cultural Revolution happening in? What setting, what environment, what were the factors that propelled it, that required it? Mao analyzed that under these conditions, with a new capitalist class, these capitalist rotors, this new bourgeoisie moving to seize power, and with society moving back towards capitalism where they held pockets and arenas of power, that a second revolution was needed, a revolution to prevent the restoration of capitalism, to keep China on the socialist road, to further revolutionize society and contribute to the advance of the world revolution. The Communist Party had grown stale and calcified, so Mao turned to young people 
with their rebellious and questioning spirit to spark this second revolution. In the schools, which not only transmit knowledge, but values and attitudes, these radical youth formed into red guards and challenged educational authority that promoted knowledge as a means of self-advancement at the expense of the larger social good and social transformation that quashed revolutionary initiative and creativity. These red guards went into factories to stir up critical thinking among workers, calling on them to examine the content of management and organization of the workplace and to resist oppressive authority. These Red Guards promoted the study of Mao's writings. They went into the countryside to open peasants' eyes and to draw peasants into this great struggle between the capitalist road and the socialist road. And in reflecting on the Cultural Revolution a few years into it, Mao Zedong explained that he was searching for a way to expose our dark aspects from below, to prevent the, re the restoration of capitalism, not through purges, arrests, and executions, but by awakening and mobilizing tens and hundreds of millions of workers peasants, students, and professionals to take part in political ideological struggle to overthrow these capitalist rotors and to carry the revolution forward into all spheres and institutions of society, including the vanguard Communist Party itself. And to do this, Mao was saying, and strategizing, to be able to do this through methods and means that would not only enable the masses of people to raise their understanding of the great contradictions and challenges involved in getting to a communist world without exploitation and oppression, but also to transform their own thinking, to break with old ideas and customs that reinforce self-first privilege and passivity. The principle of serve the people was promoted and became a measure for evaluating how society was functioning at all levels. So no, this was not vindictive mob terror as three-body problem and the bourgeois imperialist accounts of the Cultural Revolution would have you believe. Let's look at the main forms of struggle of the Cultural Revolution. There was mass debate over policy and the direction of society in all kinds of public forums, at all levels of society, through newspapers. In, Be in Beijing, for instance, there were 900 new newspapers that were published you know, as the Cultural Revolution unfolded. Through the means of what were called big character posters. These are handwritten posters displaying large Chinese characters that were used as a means of protest, political messaging, and popular communication. These were means through which people expressed themselves freely. And this was encouraged by the revolutionary forces. Means through which they expressed themselves freely, arguing over the big questions of this struggle over the road forward for revolutionary China. Big posters, big debate. Try that at fucking Columbia and Barnard University today, where the university is banning students from posting pro Palestine storms, pro, <laughs> I'm so angry, pro Palestine signs on their dorm doors. Not to mention the repression of student protest. So there was mass debate. There was mass political mobilization, demonstrations, strikes, and protests, even uprisings as occurred in Shanghai in early January 1967, when revolutionary workers 
rose up to politically challenge and overthrow the capitalist, the capitalist rotors who ruled the city. And what followed this great uprising in January of 1967 was further debate and experimentation, which with Maoist leadership led to the development of new revolutionary participatory forms of governance and administration. And there was mass criticism that took place in public gatherings and assemblies, criticism of high-ranking authorities promoting capitalist-style policies and programs, and also criticism, more broadly, of administrators and professionals with important responsibility who came under the influence of the bourgeois elitist outlook and had grown detached from basic people. No authority at any level was exempt from this kind of criticism. You know, I gave a speech many years ago in Mexico City, and I had a translator, and I talked about, you know, these forms of mass struggle and the mass criticism. And at one point I said, you know, and there was this mass criticism. It was like an electroshock treatment for a lot of... And then that was literally translated, and someone said, what, they were administering electric shocks? <laughs> but that is the way the anti-communist propaganda, you know, plays out. So all of what I am describing is what I mean when I say that the Cultural Revolution was springing society into the air. This was the deepest, most thoroughgoing revolution in human history, and it resulted in path-breaking transformations and new innovative practices. There was the formation of new revolutionary committees of political and administrative power. There was the inauguration of the Barefoot Doctors Movement. This was educated youth from the cities and peasants who were trained in the countryside to provide preventive medicine in the rural areas of China. And this contributed to the development of the most egalitarian, needs-based healthcare system in the world at the time. Shanghai in the early 1970s, by the way, had a lower infant mortality rate than New York City. There was the creation of new revolutionary art, ambitious undertakings, like the revolutionary reinvention of Chinese opera and ballet, combining traditional and Western forms and techniques with bold new narratives, like that of the red detachment of women that put strong, independent women front and center, challenging patriarchal custom and belief. There was the practice of what was called open door research, in which scientists and technical personnel went to the countryside to share knowledge with and to conduct scientific experimentation among, alongside, peasants, and to learn from them as well. Well, we've put together a little carousel of slides to illustrate some of what I'm talking about. So why don't you uh, fire it up? I'm going to get it. OK. So this first slide is um, of, a, of a big character poster on that wall that was put up by someone or some group and you know the kinds of things I've been talking about you know positions debate on issues of policy and the direction of the cultural revolution and what was happening in society and these would be put up and as, as I said the the, the 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 government provided the the materials you know to do this and uh, here are people assembling let's go on and here's another you know, instance of that. Um, you can see, um, you know, there are a lot of women here who are engaged in this cultural revolution. And a lot of this was happening, you know, in public plazas, but also in back alleys, you know, and in neighborhoods. Let's go on. This is, um, this is um, a barefoot doctor. And uh, is there another slide on the barefoot doctor? Yeah, and here, 
here, here they are in a, um, you know, in a rural area. Um, there were one million barefoot doctors trained in 1966 to 1976. And um, the medical personnel to, popu you know, to the population ratio went from about, uh, let me see the statistic here, went from I, uh, one in 8,000 to one per 760 people. So it's pretty remarkable, okay? So let's go on. And this is a, uh, this, this is a photo of the red detachment of women. And, um, you know, this, uh, this was um, what was called a model, you know, it was a model ballet and a model opera. It became a film, and it's based on a, on a Chinese novel that, in fact, is based on a true story of um, women uh, on Hainan Island, you know, in China, you know, who had suffered cruelly under landlord rule, and one, and and you know, and and some of them escape and fight back and join, you know, this company, an all-female company, I mean, fighting force, platoon, of uh, the Red Army at the time, and. Um, it's 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 an incredible work if people you know and you you know if, um, in terms of its you know content in terms of you know the you know the form and um, you know and the questions that it's putting before people one of the themes of it is that you can't make revolution out of revenge you know there's some there are bigger issues the liberation of people there's the question of women you know their role in society and you know we we've, we've had a book here and I have it with me called. Some of us Chinese women growing up in Mao's China. And this is written by um, young women at the time. They were mainly uh, students who had gone into the countryside as part of, you know, breaking down these divisions between mental and manual labor and the town and the country. And in this book, some of us, they talk about how the red detachment of women was very empowering for women, you know, in terms of the gender equality and the struggle for women's liberation, and it opened up a lot of new possibility from the realm of art and culture. Let's move on. Um, this is, um, you know, this is in a factory, and this is um, study and discussion that's taking place. People are discussing Marxist theory, and they're discussing, you know, other issues that are confronting society and the world, and, you know, just think about it. There's, you know, this kind of lively discussion and study going on as part of the workday in the workplace, okay? Uh, let's move on. Here's Mao. Anyone know who that is? Okay, that, yeah, that's Mao and W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois is a great African-American scholar, historian, activist, revolutionary, and communist. And he had tremendous uh, admiration for the Chinese Revolution, and he had visited and lived there for a time. And you know, here he is meeting Mao. And in the, um, I don't know how many people here might have attended the dialogue between uh, Bob Avakian and uh, Cornell West on revolution and religion, the fight for emancipation and the role of religion. But at one point, you know, there was some exchange between them, and. And Baba Vakian told the story that, you know, that, that, that Du Bois, you know, had a meeting and discussion with Mao, and, and, and Du Bois at one point, you know, greatly exasperated, said to Mao, you know, I've made so many mistakes. And Mao responded, but you didn't make the biggest mistake, which was to give up on revolution. So anyway, let's go on. And um, this is a poster. And uh, it says, uh, I had it translated by a student at Columbia. It says, um, resolutely support the American black people's righteous struggle against racism. Okay, and this was the spirit of the Cultural Revolution, the internationalist spirit, you know. And uh, let's go on. And there you have you know, a kind of an image that's very emblematic and very iconic of the kinds of things I'm talking about. Okay, let's shut that off. So what about the claims 
What about the claims of mass violence and ugly attacks on people and their work? Is that opening scene of three-body problem with the astrophysicist being publicly shamed and beaten an accurate reflection of the main character and spirit of the cultural revolution? No, it's a gross distortion. The methods that I mentioned earlier, mass debate, mass political mobilization, mass criticism, were clearly spelled out in official and widely publicized documents, including this guidance from which I am directly quoting. Quote, where there is debate, it should be conducted by reasoning and not by force. Now, acts of violence and beatings and incidents of public humiliation did occur during the Cultural Revolution. But here is what the evidence shows. This was not the main trend of the Cultural Revolution, and it was assuredly not the orientation of Mao. Second, when things went in a violent and vengeful direction, Mao and the revolutionary forces condemned and criticized such trends through statements, directives, editorials, and on-the-ground interventions, such as what happened at a university in Beijing, where Red, Red Guard student groups began getting very factional and were fighting each other, and they took up arms against each other, and a team of workers went into that university to put a stop to that, not by shooting people, not by arresting people, but by going in there and struggling with people about what are the aims of the Cultural Revolution and what are the methods of it, and why are you putting yourself insular interest above the greater needs of what this revolution is all about. And finally, in terms of understanding what was happening and the violence that did occur, much of this was fanned during the Cultural Revolution um, and instigated by the capitalist rotors themselves, especially for the purpose of discrediting Mao and the Cultural Revolution. And some the capitalist orders actually um, started some Red Guard groups, you know, that were not carrying out Mao's, you know, orientation and perspective and not fighting for what this Cultural Revolution was fighting to accomplish. So there's an important methodological point for all of us to grapple with here. Revolutions and great upsurges are complex phenomena. Any appraisal of a period of history or a mass movement must examine its main elements and features that define its essential nature. Let's take a current example. The student movement in solidarity with the Palestinian people in opposing genocide in Gaza. Now, the backers and supporters of apartheid Israel argue that this movement is anti-Semitic. Well, that's reactionary nonsense. Are there elements of anti-Semitism among some involved in this struggle? Yes, but that's utterly secondary and minor, and it's not what defines and propels this righteous struggle forward. So there's this methodological point. We have to apply that in everything. What are the main and defining features of a process of an historical period? I want to return now to the issue of science and that scene at the beginning of three-body problem where Einstein's theory of relativity and the Big Bang theory are excoriated as bourgeois and imperialist. Is there any truth to this depiction? Well, there is. And this brings us back to Bob Avakian's insistence on a thoroughly scientific approach to understanding and changing the world. Avakian has emphasized that truth is truth. Truth is truth. But there was not that correct understanding during the Cultural Revolution. What do I mean? In one of the major circulars guiding the Cultural Revolution, it is stated 
that the bourgeoisie has its truth and the proletariat has its truth. In other words, truth is not truth, it's class truth, it's identity truth. Again, Avakian, truth is truth, no matter who says it. And this notion of class truth is not only scientifically wrong, because there's only one world and one reality. It's also an obstacle, as Avakian emphasizes, to getting beyond a world where might makes right, where what is deemed true is based on who has the power and the authority to declare and enforce it, rather than what actually corresponds to reality. Scientific theories cannot be evaluated on the basis of the politics, the class position, gender, or other identity of its proponents. In terms of Einstein and relativity and the Big Bang, it is true that criticism was launched during the Cultural Revolution. That criticism was not based on deep engagement with these theories, but on ideological and philosophical suspicions and dogmatic approaches to Marxism. This led some forces of the Cultural Revolution to dismiss these theories out of hand. Why? Because Einstein's ideas might be, uh, might be um, used to promote relativism about time and space that they don't objectively exist. Or in the case of the Big Bang, some declared it erroneous because the theory opens the door to a possible argument for an absolute beginning of the universe, and that could be used to justify the existence of a non-material God. Well, this is not consistent with a deep scientific understanding of the Big Bang Theory, or it's not consistent at all with a scientific approach to evaluating theory, scientific theory. So there's more to understand about what was happening. But the influence of this kind of thinking was not only a fetter on the Cultural Revolution, but, as I said, to what it's going to take to get to communism. So this brings us back to the methodological principle of using the criterion of identifying the main and defining character of an historical phenomenon. And by doing that, we can determine that the Cultural Revolution was not in its essence anti-science. During the Cultural Revolution, scientists synthesized the protein for insulin, satellite and computer technology advanced, and at the same time, and very importantly and uniquely, science was popularized throughout society. Basic primers educated peasants and workers about the scientific method and challenged superstition. Technical and research institutes and related factories would invite people from the neighborhoods to observe and learn from the work being done. In the rural areas where professional scientists went to conduct experiments and to learn from the, to conduct experiments and education alongside peasants, the experience and practical knowledge of peasants was brought into this mix and this process of further deepening understanding and further developing sustainable agricultural practices. All this was part of breaking down that ages-old division between mental and manual labor. As for the issue of the Cultural Revolution and the environment, and how three-body problem would have you believe that Mao was waging a war on nature to accelerate economic development, no matter the environmental consequences, this is grotesquely and obscenely wrong. See, in that first episode, you see forests being cleared, and a young official gives the daughter of the astrophysicist who had been killed a copy, the, her father who had been killed, a copy of Rachel Carson's famous 1972 book, Silent Spring. You know, that book exposed the tremendous environmental and health harm caused by the indiscriminate use of pesticides. 
Now, the audience watching Three-Body Problem is led to think that the West was acknowledging and seriously acting on environmental issues while this was a taboo topic in revolutionary China. To which I can only say to the Netflix creators of Three-Body Problem, how dare you? In 1961, the year before Silent Spring came out, the US imperialists initiated the most massive and deadliest campaign of chemical warfare in history. Let me repeat that. In 1961, the US imperialists initiated the most massive and deadliest campaign of chemical warfare in human history. This was in Vietnam, where the US military working with major US chemical companies sprayed herbicides like Agent Orange on vast swaths of the countryside, destroying some 5 million acres of forest and food crops, poisoning rivers and canals. It went on for 10 years until 1971, leaving hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese with birth defects and cancers. All this is part of the US's genocidal war against the Vietnamese people. Don't tell me about the enlightened West attitude toward the environment. Meanwhile, during the Cultural Revolution, socialist China was coming to a new realization of environmental dangers and harmful practices previously carried out. Campaigns to plant new forests and to reforest other areas were launched. More broadly, there was a new awareness and discourse of economic development that was compatible with environmental protection. Environmental and health goals were incorporated into local and national economic planning. And the revolution gained new knowledge from environmental efforts in other parts of the world. But this kind of learning and experimentation, and it was happening in other spheres of Chinese society, was cut short in October 1976. The capitalist rotors carried out a reactionary coup after Mao's death. This coup took place in October 1976. They suppressed the revolutionary forces and set out to systematically restructure Chinese society and economy along capitalist lines. And China has since then become a major capitalist imperialist power. This terrible defeat marked the end of the first stage of communist revolution and its high point, the cultural revolution. But we are not back to square one. Far from it. The new communism forged by Bob Avakian makes possible a new stage of communist revolution a qualitatively more emancipating revolution. Now, for a moment, let me come back to the fatalistic thematic of three-body problem. The series is telling us that humanity is doomed. An alien invasion, again, I'm talking about the film adaptation, Netflix version. The series is telling us that humanity is doomed an alien invasion is coming in 400 years, but the characters argue whether it's even worth stopping this invasion for future generations because humanity is so irredeemable. The problem lies in human nature. That's hopeless for human beings. The problem lies in the Cultural Revolution, what in fact was an incredible breakthrough for humanity, but in this saga, it's the Cultural Revolution in this distorted telling that sets this particular doom loop in motion. Three-body problem lets imperialism, U.S. imperialism, off the hook. All its crimes, all its environmental destruction, all that is possible in three-body problem is to entrust our fate to a top-secret authority of 
the imperialist system. Now, in summing up, we should be reflecting on all of what I've been saying. But in relation to this thematic, I want to make the point that there is hope for humanity. Hope on a scientific basis. We have something that has never exist, existed before in the history of humanity with the new communism developed by, commun by Baba Vakian. Now, in summing up the first stage of communist revolution, even the best of that stage, Baba Vakian has pointed to an historic contradiction. Communism is in the highest interests of the masses of people, but not all of them want communism at any given time. You can't resolve this contradiction by forced marching people to communism with a gun to their backs, whether literally or metaphorically. That is, you can't get there through intimidation and over-reliance on physical and social coercion. You have to be winning people to the cause of and the struggle to achieve communism. On the other hand, when you seize power and carry out the revolutionary transformation of power, you need to hold on to that power, but ensure that this power is worth holding on to. The Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America, authored by Bob Avakian, and you can get that at the table in front, and it's on our shelves, this Constitution embodies the solution to this historic problem. It not only protects dissent, even dissent opposed to socialism and intellectual and cultural ferment, but it promotes this in a way that has never existed in this society, indeed on a scale unseen in human history. All this in the context of a society that is aiming to end all exploitation and oppression. All this is crucial towards understanding and changing the world and creating a society that people would want to live in, that people could flourish in. You have to repeatedly win people to fight to stay on the socialist road, relying on evidence, contestation, and debate between different programs and platforms and critical thinking. And this constitution also contains provisions for contested elections in which, would, in which it would even be possible to vote socialism out of power. But the Constitution and the vision and framework for this new socialist society has safeguards that would make that very difficult. Because again, communism is in the highest interests of world humanity. Now we have materials here that people can read and discuss to learn more about the new communism. And especially important and highly accessible in both senses of the word is BA official, Baba Vakian's social media site. Now, I want to end where I began. The world is a horror. We face truly existential threats in the danger of nuclear war and global warming. But this is also a time of heightened revolutionary possibility. The document, We Are the Revcoms, explains, it's available here and I'm reading, this is a rare time when the capitalist imperialists who rule over us in this country are deeply divided in a way they have not been since the Civil War in the 1860s. And the country is being ripped apart with one section moving toward an outright fascist form of rule, with the other fighting for the horrific way things have been. They cannot resolve these deep divisions and hold the country together on the basis of the, quote, normal way uh, this system has operated. And in any case, that normal way is full of oppression, destruction, and the real danger of wiping out humanity. For these reasons, this revolution we are working for is urgently necessary and more possible. 
This rare time is an historic opportunity, not a guarantee, but a real chance to leap into a whole other world, a new world. And the Revcom's followers of Revcom, of, excuse me, and the Revcom's followers of Bob Avakian are seizing on and working on this rare opening to make revolution. So to conclude, as I have pointed out on my national speaking tour, yes, the anti-communist brainwash is pervasive. It confuses and disorients people. Our current case in point, Exhibit A, three-body problem. Yes, we have to struggle hard for the truth and raise people's sights. But we also have a lot going for us. The productive capacity, the technology, the knowledge, the interconnectedness of world humanity open up incredible potential to solve material and social problems and act on the environmental emergency. But only on the basis of a fundamentally different, a radically different system, socialism moving towards communism. We have this rare and unique leadership of Baba Vakian, who has rescued the communist project and taken it higher, and who is giving ongoing leadership to this revolution. We have the strategy to make revolution, and in the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America, the vision and blueprint for a truly liberatory socialist society. This revolution is in the interest of the billions in all parts of the world who are denied a decent life and a future worth living or any future at all. So to those of you here at Revolution Books, to those of you watching the video of this talk, and to all who yearn for a radically different and far better world, there is nothing more urgent, more meaningful, that you can be doing with your lives now than becoming part of, spreading, and contributing to this revolution to emancipate humanity and protect the planet. Thank you. More, more or less methodological, because in the Cultural Revolution, there seems to be different sets. And, um, and uh, on the one hand, there are the um, revolutions from the bottom up, and they are like the masses who are organizing for, uh, you know, for a lot of the um, a lot a lot of the revolutionary activities, and they are fighting against the uh, old bureaucrats um, during the revolution. On the other hand, there are the old bureaucrats who at some point were also merged with some of the, uh, the you know, the Red Guards. They had the Red Guards themselves. And, you know, the party was um, was supporting supporting the former group, while at some point when thinking the former group has went too far, like, you, you know, two anarchists and all that, uh, sided with the latter group, and they were you know, back and forth, and oftentimes there, the former group, like the masses, felt the party has betrayed them. Um, but it seems to be a theoretical problem, because if you think about it, um, you can't really let, let go of your own power and give all the power to people, but still uh, have a control of where the revolution is headed to and what, what forms it takes. And Mao Zedong actually, said um, in the, you know, Renmin Gongshu, in the people's communes, there, there ha still has to be party committees, and there can't be, there, ca there can't be no party in the communes. So, um, so there, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a conflict. At, at some point you want to hold power and you want to have control, but you still want to let go of your own power. So, like, do, how do you see the problem being re uh, resolved? Did other, I mean, okay, so I'm going to, let me take one question at a time, right? Um, well, I think this is a really important question that you're raising, right? And, um, you know, the example of what happened in Shanghai in 1967 is a useful one. This was called the January Shanghai Storm, when you had people rising up, different worker organizations, some of the Red Guard groups, right, had joined into uh, a force 
right? That you know mobilized, that went into the streets, you know, that 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 communicated with you know with millions of people, and that called for people to rise up against this entrenched uh, revisionist bureaucratic administration that was running the city. It was you know a stronghold at that time of the capitalist rotors. And people rose up. And as I said, um, after overthrowing, and this was political, a polit- I mean, it was very intense. I mean, people were in the streets. There were sit-down strikes, right? And at one point, uh, some workers tried to block a, tr- a train from leaving the city. And the revolutionary forces said, no, this is not an appropriate way to struggle because we still have to maintain you know, the functioning of the economy. It was very complex, right? And at first... What happened was that people said we have to do away with the 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 the, the party you know the exist the party form and the existing administrative form and replace it with a model of governance closer to what existed for a short period of time during the Paris Commune. So there was a call for a Shanghai Commune, and this new form of organization would have you know some of the features of that original commune you could directly recall uh, officials and leaders and it was very loosely knit you know in terms of how it was functioning um, and there was an actual period where they were forging this Shanghai commune but what happened was that the you know the Maoist forces they were learning alongside people they were summing up you know the the, the experimentation and sort of the, both the the felt need for a radically different form of governance but also a, analyzing how would this how would this operate within the larger you know uh, society and what 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 the Maoists you know came, they came to the conclusion that this was not a, a, a suitable form of power for a number of reasons. One, it would not effectively deter counter-revolution because it was too, new, too loosely you know, knit and, 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 and conceived, and it, it wouldn't have the ability you know, to resist real counter-revolution. So you need a, a, an, an instrument of power that's opening, you know, that's opening up to the masses of people that's bringing in fresh blood that's 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 leading and administering in a new revolutionary kind of way but it has to have enough um strength and and backbone if you will and the organizational ability let me just finish okay to you know to you know to withstand counter revolution and something else that you your, the goal of the revolution was not to dissolve society into small, you know, local or you know, municipal communal uh, units, but to create, you know, to reinvigorate the dictatorship of the proletariat, you know, to revolutionize this form of state power. And if you have a commune form of governance, not only is it you know, more difficult to withstand, you know, counter-revolution, and that's a real danger. But also, you know, you can't coordinate the activities of society, you know, in the way and on the level that you need to. In other words, you want to be able to have a socialist economy that's meeting the needs of society overall, not simply the workers of Shanghai. They will do what they want to do, and others will have to negotiate with this commune, you know? So, you know, you had a, 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 a situation in Shanghai, for instance, as part of the overall economic plan, revolutionary economic planning, where many of the skilled and technical workers of Shanghai were being sent to other parts of the country that didn't have that level of skill and expertise. And this is what a, a socialist economic system makes possible. Because as I said at the outset, you want to overcome these great differences and gaps between town and country and uh, uh, industry and agriculture. And the, the, the commune form, right, and these kinds of localized instruments of, you know, of governance were not suited for the transformation, the radical transformation of society. Your ability, as I said, to steer and allocate resources, to coordinate, to learn, you know, so that it, and, and, and what, what you're, and this is why a lot of people, you know, thought the Cultural Revolution had been betrayed when the, when the Shanghai Commune was disbanded in place of what became the Shanghai Revolutionary Committee. And that Shanghai, 
you know, Revolutionary Committee, which existed on different levels in Shanghai. There was a citywide one and revolutionary committees in the factories and the neighborhoods. But this new form of power you know, brought together revolutionary cadre, members of the party, with representatives of mass organization, okay, and with, um, you know, with people in any given uh, arena or field where such a revolutionary committee who are, you know, knowledgeable and expert in that, you know, in that sphere. For instance, in a factory, you would have, you know, tech, you know, technicians, you would have revolutionary managers, you'd have revolutionary, you know, party members. And, you know, so you were, you were creating what, what they call three in one combinations, you know, and this was a, a synthesis of, of all the experience of that Shang, you know, that the revolutionary committee that was forged in Shanghai became a model you know, for governance and administration elsewhere. So that's, you know, what was, what was happening. The point was not to, to, to put an end, to disband the revolutionary vanguard party, but to revolutionize it. The point was not to, you know, to devolve political power into self-determining local units, but to create a new revolutionary mode of, 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 of functioning as part of the revolutionization of state power, socialist state power. There's much more to be said, but I'm hoping that that, you know, sort of addresses some, you know, some aspects of, you know, of what you're, you know, of what you're raising. So there is a difference, and let me just say this, there are many people who who were inspired by the Cultural Revolution because they felt that it was a revolution against bureaucracy and hierarchy as such. But no, it was not a revolution against bureaucracy and hierarchy as such. It was a revolution, you know, against, you know, the, 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 the revisionist, you know, degeneration of what was happening in society. These capitalist rotors who were taking society down this capitalist road. And you need administration. You need, you know, in the positive sense, bureaucrats. You need people who are skilled at doing certain kinds of things, you know, to make institutions function. But they have to be you know, but they have to be operating according to what I said earlier in the in the talk, according to the principle of serve the people. And they have to be part of the all-round transformation of society. But the Cultural Revolution did radically diminish the number of bureaucratic agencies and officialdom. There was an aspect in which, you know, you had had this overstuffed officialdom, you know, in the in the structures of society. So the, the Cultural Revolution, you know, in creating these new forms, the revolutionary committees, and in giving a lot more initiative to what was happening at local levels of society was transforming these things. But you still have hierarchy, and there's still a, a role that it's going to play, you know, in society where people have certain roles and responsibilities. But you want to minimize what you know, is unnecessary in that, which is fortifying privilege in which people's particular position becomes a source of advantage over others. And you want to wage ideological struggle over for whom and for what are we doing, what we're doing. And it's not reducible to a kind of a plan to streamline or abolish bureaucracy. That's not actually a revolutionary solution to the problem. So I want to start... Stop there because I know I've said a lot. Let's give someone else another ch a chance, okay? And then we'll we'll come back. But I, it's a really important point that you're raising, and there's been a lot of confusion about the Cultural Revolution along those very lines. Not your confusion. I'm saying, you know, that people think that it was a betrayal. Can I see a show of hands of people who have seen? Um, uh, three body problem or a little of it okay okay so those who have raised their hands saw that opening episode which kind of presents this 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 as I said this sensationalistic lurid untrue account of you know what was happening okay so it's I'm, I'm glad to see that a portion of the audience knows what I'm referring to Others who haven't seen it know what I'm referring to because I've 
explained it and its significance, right? So we're all in the house and we're all in the discussion together. Yeah, great. Yeah, I see you second row, yeah, or third row. Something that I didn't know from my personal experience reading about the Cultural Revolution and studying its importance on the broader era of revolution that it was the cap of was the uh, you showed that poster of uh, of discussion and debate in the workplace, and that that's something that's always been really striking to me and really exciting to me. And I didn't know that that was something that happened during the Cultural Revolution. I I always think about the fact that uh, a big thing in a lot of uh, union circles is the idea that you have more in common with. Uh, people who you share a job with, the people that you uh, share a area with, that, that you may be better represented by someone who is within the same union than someone who is, lives within the same area as you. And I guess what I posit to you is how do I bring that conversation of the real life that I experience uh, and that is shared by people who experience it in my workplace? How do, how do I bring that conversation of, of how are we living our lives? How, how do I bring that, that debate and, and I, I guess, uh, educational thought and, and openness to learn more about the experience of other? How do I bring that to the workplace? How do you suggest opening up that environment that is m much more closed down in, in the current society? Well, that's a, I mean, it's a, it's, that too, is, it's a good question. I mean, the first point is you are working in a capitalist imperialist system. You're working in a society and economy which could give a shit about what, you know, what your life experience and work experience is because you are an appendage of the machine you know, and you are a source of profit and more profit. The whole way in which the society is organized is not to create, you know, the kind of environment, you know, that you're talking about, but the kind of discussions that you do want to get into is how do we, how do we put an end, you know, to this system? That's the kind of discussion, because we can't create that kind of environment that you're you know, sort of commenting on it. Listen, you know, there were cultural troops that were, you know, created in factories, in the communes, you know, that, you know, some of the, you know, that, that some of these model operas, you know, there were different, you know, librettos and, you know, ways in which they were, you know, presented as plays and so on and so forth. This was going on throughout society. You know, it's really remarkable that culture and art was part of the life experience, you know, broad numbers of people, you know, and, um, you know, many stories I can share. And, you know, there's some interesting books, you know, about that. Uh, there's one by Mobo Gao, a professor in Australia called Gao Village. And he talks about, um, you know, what it meant to have this kind of revolutionary culture in the, in the countryside. You know, he talks about people were learning, you know, learning how to read, learning how to perform music, you know, as a result of that. They were breaking down that the stories and, you know, the films, what they were able to do was kind of breaking down a lot of the sort of the clannishness, you know, in the, you know, in the, in the, in, even in the, you know, in the collectives and, you know, and people were, were doing whole, whole new things, you know, and then you can read a book by Dong Ping Han on, you know, the cultural revolution in his village. And he talks about how the red book by Mao became a charter, for the, you know, for the, you know, for the right of people to stand up, you know, and call out, you know, this revisionist authority, you know, the bourgeois capitalist road and, you know, and to fight for the, you know, for the, for the, for the socialist road. So in terms of, you know, what you're, you know, what you're describing, you know, one, as I said, that, you know, we, we can't have, you know, we, we can't have a socialist factory within a capitalist, you know, society. And that's, Part of the uh, you know the you know the illusion and actually you know the you know the toxic you know effect of this notion of you know workers control and democratic socialism because the call for democratic socialism you know we got to start fighting for it now is really a, a, a kind of a, a call to try to 
democratize capitalism, you know, when we have to transform society and the whole world, you know, we have to spring society, you know, into the air. So, you know, that's the, you know, the, the first point I wanted to make that, you know, that we have to sort of recognize the kind of society and, you know, world that we currently live in. And the most important thing is we have to, you know, make this revolution, you know, to put an end to it. So, you know, I, I, I think that, A, there are, le- you know, there, there are, there's lessons, there's experience in the Cultural Revolution, you know, this notion of a total revolution in all spheres of society and life, you know, the, 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 the importance of, of people, basic people grappling with the biggest questions, what were called the cardinal issues of society and the world, you know, when, you know, in, in 1968, after, Ma- after Martin Luther King you know, was was assassinated, you know, and the hundreds, hundred cities went up in flames, you know, Mao issued a statement in support of that rebellion. And, and people in China were in the streets, you know, showing solidarity, but also learning about, you know, that, you know, the, the conditions and the situation facing, you know, black people in the U.S. and seeing this revolution, you know, in this world context. So the... Um, you know, so there are a lot of things, you know, that we can learn. But the new communism is what's required now, because I've pointed to some of the, you know, the problems and the shortcomings, you know, of the Cultural Revolution. This was a, an extraordinary event, you know, the high point of that first stage of communist revolution. But we have to go much further and do much better. And that's what the new communism brought forth by Baba Vakin, you know, learning from you know, that overwhelmingly positive experience, but also pinpointing, you know, some of the serious, you know, dip, you know, problems that I've pointed to and how we now have the basis and the framework to make an even more emancipating revolution. And that's what's required. And that's what we're building and organizing for. So, you know, I think the discussion among your fellow, you know, work, you know, your fellow workers, you know, has to turn on what is what are we facing, you know, at this moment in human history, both the great danger and the peril, but also this revolutionary possibility. And look, the stakes, as I said, could not be higher, you know, the danger of world war, of, you know, the climate catastrophe, and there is a way out. And I think that's what people have to, you know, get to know, get to be part of, get to contribute to. And, you know, this, this, you know, this new communism and, you know, that, the strategy for people, the next question is, well, how are you going to make this revolution, you know? And you know, there's a strategy for it. What's going to come after it? Well, there's a, a blueprint for the new society and the constitution for the new socialist republic. Now, this is a very controversial discussion to have in your workplace, right? <laughs> you know, but, you know, you know, the, it's funny here, in a, you know, kind of play, roll the, you know, roll the tape back. You know, it's a, it was a very controversial discussion to have in the Chinese workplace in 1965, where people, you know, had been kind of numbed by this, you know, revisionist capitalist rotor program. And when the Red Guards came in, you know, a lot of workers said, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? You know, I got to keep working. I got to, you know, meet my, you know, meet my quota, what have you, you know. So we are talking about, you know, sort of changing the world, radically changing the world. So, you know, this is what we have to be, you know, and, and, and then there is a strategy for this revolution, and I'll just stop with this, and that is, I mean, a keystone of this is, you know, fight the power and transform the people for revolution. That's a, an important component of this strategy for revolution, that there are these incredible injustices and assaults, you know, the right to abortion, the attacks on immigrants, what's happening to the environment. We, have, we can't allow this just to go down, you know, oh, we're waiting for a revolution. No, we're building this revolution, and we have to fight the power around these things, but we have to raise, we have to fight the power and transform the thinking of people for revolution. We have to bring to people, you know, the understanding of what the problem is, this capitalist imperialist system, and what the solution is, you know, which is a revolution to overthrow this system and bring this new society, you know. So we have to be, you know, we're building this movement for revolution actively, energetically, but our numbers are small, and right now, the key, the key task before us is to bring forward, 
you know, new revolutionaries, revolutionary people, you know, first in the thousands. But when we get the thousands, we can be influencing and impacting millions, right? And the situation in society is sharpening. Look, the election in November is going to be a real watershed, right? The Trump fascists have made it very clear that if they don't win, they're going to win, <laughs> you know, that they're going to, you know, and they're prepared to to, to wage civil war, you know, so the society is really at the top. These, these, the, the, uh, you know, the slave masters are fighting each other. And, and when the slave masters are fighting each other, that creates more opportunity for the slaves to rise up. So, you know, we're, we're we facing a very, you know, a, you know, a, a, a situation of enormous danger and peril, but also of heightened revolutionary possibility. And we have to seize on that. And that too is something that you should be sharing with you know your your fellow workers. So let's go to other people. Hey guys, uh, my name is Salima. We hear um, you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So kind of, I want to kind of piggyback on you. What was your name? My name is Sangria, like the liquor. Sangria. <laughs> Sangria. 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 I just want to piggyback on Sangria. Um, uh, in terms of kind of bringing that ideology to work, all you do is talk about it. Don't even think about it, just talk about it. Because um, I work in a very uh, Jewish hospital, so I, for me personally, I can get fired for anything I post on social media. Can anything you repeat? You can, can get fired? About. Just repeat that. I'm sorry. Um, I can get fired for certain political ideas yeah. I post on social media, but that doesn't stop me from talking about things that happen, you know, global affairs and political things that happen across the globe. Yeah. And when you bring that to the workplace, you just have to analyze the people that you work around and how they react. And once you take that into mind, you can kind of gauge who you can talk about that with and how far you can go. Because a lot of people are open to talk about that in the workplace. You just have to take that chance and keep going. Mm -hmm. Then um, I also want to get into the next thing I wanted to ask in terms of the Revolution Communist Party. Um, I personally believe that for revolution, community is very important. Community communication and engagement is super important. One of the questions that I had was how does the Revolution Communist Party kind of engage and support grassroots organizations how do you guys engage with the community uh, where you're situated in in new york mm -hmm. to kind of ensure that people are talking and getting involved mm -hmm. with the party mm -hmm. and you know s such thing as just grassroots like you can kind of bring this into uh, mm -hmm. things like this or gardening outside things outside of protesting, what are some ways that the Revolution Communist Party engage with the community? We have some uh, organizers here in the room, revolutionaries. They might want to, from the RevCom Corps for the Emancipation of Humanity, might want to, I see a hand, say who you are and what you want to say. I'm Tatu with the RevCom Corps for the Emancipation of Humanity you know, the chapter here in New York City, and we recruiting you, and we recruiting people into the ranks of the Recon Corp, you know, and especially this bookstore is a big part of that. Mm. So when you walk into, you know, through the door, you actually, you know, start looking at, you know, the books on the, on the bookshelves, the books on the table, you know, and, and, and the heart of it, you know, the big heart of this bookstore, the new communism. You can learn about it, you know, the vision of this, you know, this, the, the science of how we can understand every social question, the vision of the new society, but also not to just, as just to query you, just talking, you know, having a nice conversation about how great society could be out of this monster system of capitalism, imperialism, but actually to go to work on it. And right now, as Raymond described it, you know, the world is crying out for this revolution, you know, with, the, with everything he described facing humanity. You know, we need mil thousands of people right now 
and ultimately billions of people to be part of this revolution. And right now, we're calling on you to be part of this revolution, spreading the word, come up with us. We're going to places like Columbia University, CCNY here in the neighborhood. May 1st, we're going to march through the neighborhood announcing that we need and we demand a whole other way to live in a fundamentally different system. And we're calling everybody in Harlem and other, or other organizations. You should take responsibility and tell them, you need to be on May 1st, marching along with the Red Concord. Bring your panel, bring your demands, be there, you know? So talk to us afterwards. Huh? Hi. Uh, I don't know, uh, did someone, anyone else, uh, you want, let me, I just wait, I just want to know if anyone else from the Revcom court, you know, because the question was about, what do we, I know someone was on the, doing, is on the border, right? The U.S. <laughs> U.S.-Mexican border, with the Revcoms on the border. The migrant, you know, this whole migrant, the, 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 the lives of migrants being thrown into this meat grinder. Yeah, I just got back from Texas. Um, we were in the border at Eagle Pass, you know, where the, um, the, they've stationed all these National Guard troops. They've taken over the city park to put up um, all along the border of the Rio Grande um, rolls and rolls of razor wire so that people who cross the border are, you know, like torn up in the razor wire and then the National Guard arrests them and um, right I went down there right after a mother with her two children had got caught in the razor wire and um, they, the National Guards of Texas would not allow the Border Patrol in to rescue the people supposedly and of course the Border Patrol is um, you know neither, it's a, it's a force that oppresses the people and you know <laughs> so it's a question of what what revolutionary forces, you know, can bring to the people of like, how do we solve this terrible problem of like, you know, this is, um, you know, here people are escaping, you know, um, terrible violence and economic destruction and, you know, um, the women are largely raped and, you know, they come into Texas where they have, you know, their rights are the same as a fetus, you know, a fertilized egg. I mean, we have a solution for humanity and we were trying to bring that to the people there and, you know, take that all over the community and um, call on people to, you know, resist this whole thing and demand, you know, this, um, that we need a revolution and make sure that's heard and, you know, over in Mexico and and all over and so we we exist the Revcom Corps for Emancipation of Humanity is a national organization and we exist in a number of places and um, you know we're going out all over this you know <laughs> this area so I don't know if okay I saw a hand let's see other hands um, and I know you have your hand up, and then the first questioner had another question. I thought, right? The first, you had another. No, she'll go after after first Jane, and then you'll. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, my name is Jane. I'm here with Revolution Books. I'm the development director here, and I wanted to say something about the community here. Lima, is that your name? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Halima. Halima. Okay. Um, the most important thing that people can do in this world, and what we um, value as a big part of this community, is for humanity to get free. And that's gonna take the revolution. Um, there's, there's a joy in that, and there's struggle in that, okay? And that's another aspect of this community. That's what we're doing here today. I hope when we break up and get to talk informally, people can, you know, share with each other what it meant, what was it like to be part of this discussion. This is not about the selfishness that Raymond talked about. There's, there's a million ways in which, which this system pulls people back into the horror, to living with the horror and dying with the horror. And here, it's about something much bigger than that. Um, so, I, I, you know, it's not the traditional way that people think about community and grassroots, 
But I'll tell you, that a lot of the grassroots have their heads up their asses right now. I'm sorry. It really is a big part of what we're facing right now. You know, that people are now, there's a whole article in the New York Times today about how all these people are getting swept up in mm. the Democrats because that's better than Trump. When this Biden is a war criminal. So that's something that we need to talk about. And that's what we do here. And I was just saying that's only one part of what we do here. But for people to come, liberate their minds, liberate what their lives are about, and make it about that. So um, I just wanted to bring in what might not sound like the answer that you expected, Halima, but it is a very critical part of um, building community that really matters. All right. Um, so let me see. Um, we're going to go back to you. I, I still disagree because I think um, the um, the corporate revolution in history ends up being only two years being grassroots and bottom up, and the rest of the eight years could be characterized as still top down. And you know, people just it is not a mobilization of the masses, but the masses are being mobilized by the top down. So I I, I identify that as a problem, and I wonder if there is a better way to go about it, and what could be what could be done. And um, a lot of the political discussions are actually, I think, still um, become, you know, politicized and become like power struggles. So what are some of the... You, the lot of the discussion, be, uh, the, I just missed the phrase before power struggle. A lot of the um, dis debates about truth, what, what is truth, become actually um, has to do with the power, um, po you know, the power that that be in the day, and a lot of it was, um, you know, first heavily politicized and then heavily depoliticized, which ha carries its own problems. But I, I feel like that was like a, um, a problem for corporate revolution, and uh, along with some of the other problems, like, you know, uh, people are judged based on their, like, um, uh, who their fathers or mothers are, and that's another problem. Oh, the, can you, just a little louder on that last point. Oh yeah, so like people are uh, characterized by their like bird class, and um, people who are like the poorest farmers are like um, they are like the, you know the proudest uh, walking on the street, and people who are the children of like uh, rich parents, they are like they 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 are like very you know diffident and. All that. So that I think that's another problem. Is it isn't true equality, but it's the opposite. You know, it's just the hierarchy but turned upside down. But it's still inequality. So like, what are I guess some of the solutions, or like, have you considered this problem? What how, how do we like avoid these problems be happening again? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a no, no. There's a lot that's. You know, sort of contained in your observations and question, and you know, I just want to maybe just touch on a few, you know touch on a few points, right? One, you know, there is a in the culture. You know, Mao said we want to. I don't know if you were here for the earlier, you know, that part of my talk. You know, he said that in the Cultural Revolution, we wanted to expose our dark aspects from below. Right, and that was he was searching for a, a method and a form to 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 identify the 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 you know the 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 flaw you know the flaws and the defects in society and the rule of the commun you know the, sort of the leading role of the of the communist party and what it how it had become you know as I said sort of calcified and you know and 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 this new bourgeois capitalist headquarters had had emerged within the communist party and he said how are we going to deal with this and he this is the cultural revolution which i'm not going to you know re re go through you know you know the main elements of my talk etc but you know th this was you know the the cultural revolution the second revolution to rise up and to you know to call out to challenge confront these capitalist rotors at all levels of society but it was at the top levels where they had you know where they had the greatest you know you know capacity you know these capitalist rotors to remake society in a capitalist direction and you know there's a relationship between 
you know, that there was an intense struggle going on in Chinese society over the direction of that society, the capitalist or the socialist route. And that plays out throughout society, but it's concentrated at the highest levels of society because leadership, you know, the, the, revolu- you know, the, the revolutionary leadership of Mao and, and those who were closest to him, and the, you know, they were fighting for this socialist road, and that required society-wide mobilization to, you know, this idea of exposing, you know, our dark aspects from below and, 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 and catalyzing great, you know, great, 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 you know, debate and struggle at the grassroots level, that required leadership. And it, and, and it required constant leadership. The example I gave of the Shanghai Commune and the, 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 the forging of the Shanghai Revolutionary Committee, new problems, new challenges presented themselves. And this was happening not just in a vacuum. China was, you know, was facing you know, external threat and encirclement. You know, first, you know, the Vietnam War, you know, the U.S. imperialists you know, in, the, you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 60s and the early 70s, and then the emergence of of social imperialism, the Soviet social imperialists. They were not so, no longer a socialist society. And, and, and the Soviet Union, you know, had, had, had threatened nuclear war, you know, a nuclear strike against China. So you had this incredible emplacement concentration of military forces on the, on the China-Soviet border. So in other words, this is, you know, th- you know th- this is, you know, a sharp struggle, these upheavals to transform society, but it's happening in a very explosive international environment. And you need leadership to navigate through this, not just the leadership to, you know, to sum up the lessons of Shanghai and to popularize them, but you need leadership. How are we going to deal with this Soviet threat? You had sections of the revolutionary forces that began to waffle who said we can't go up against Soviet social imperialism and U.S. imperialism, you know? And, you know, and then China was, you know, the revolutionaries felt that they needed to kind of tack and maneuver to, to um, you know, to, min- you know, to kind of, you know, deal with this Soviet threat. And, and then there's that opening to the, to the West. And then there were people who were seizing upon that to say, okay, let's just, you know, let's just go with the West as our salvation. And then there were mistakes and problems made by Mao. You know, where you know, where where you know, there was a tendency to put the defense of the Chinese Revolution above the advance of the World Revolution. Now Mao was a great revolutionary, but there was this problem, and Vakin has summed up, you know, that the f- first and primary responsibility of the socialist state, even in the midst of that kind of threat and difficulty is to be a base area for the spread of world revolution so all of this is not to say oh my god it's a ball of confusion how can you no you need scientifically grounded leadership in order to 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 carry that struggle forward and the more scientifically grounded you are with this vision of the new side then the more you can unleash the initiative you know of the masses you see and that's what it's not an it's not an either or proposition, you know the masses or leadership. The masses make history, you know, and where there's oppression, people will rise up and resist it. And the masses are the makers of revolution, but they can't make revolution and they can't wage struggle in the highest interest of humanity without revolutionary leadership. And that leadership itself has to be continually revolution. This is what Mao was saying. So, you know, the, 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 you know, this is something that comes up. Why didn't they just get rid of the Communist Party? Because if they did, then the bourgeoisie would just walk into power. You know, that, that was, you know, you can't, Court, as I said, you can't run a society, you can't rule, you can't have a, 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 a revolutionary society without a revolutionary state power and without a visionary vanguard leadership. But you want to be, this is what Mao was fighting to do and sometimes, you know, he expressed his disappointment. We need to bring forward new revolutionary successors. And they had problems in doing that. There's a lot to be said about this. But uh, you're going to say something. Go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, ju- I just wanted to... Mike. Mike. Oh. Thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to add, because I think, look, this is a really important question that you're raising, right? And I think, you know, look, there's a tremendous amount, like, if you read Bob Vivekian's work, where he's really actually trying to work on the contradiction you're raising. Because this is a massive contradiction, right, of constantly trying to transform the leadership and the masses so that you're, like he said, you're putting your arms around all of society to move it somewhere. So we no longer have, we get to a position where you no longer even need a state, right? So, uh, and I just wanted to read this out, and I really want to suggest, right, that people get Baba Vakian's breakthroughs because he's concentrating some very big lessons about how we can actually be emancipated, right? Not, you know, yes, the greatest heights that we achieved with the Cultural Revolution, but we got to go beyond that, you Far know? Beyond it. And here he says, because, you see, like, one of the biggest contradictions is you, you're still in a world largely characterized by and for a period of time dominated by the relations and ideas of an exploitative system. The spontaneity will always, and for a long period of time at least, go in the direction of falling in line with those exploitative and oppressive relations or seeking shortcuts which objectively land you there. This is where the rub becomes very acute, to put it that way that for a long time there will be the need for a core leading group which is, which is objectively in a different position than the masses it's leading. The decisive question is what methods flowing from what kind of outlook, what kind of scientific or anti-scientific approach is applied to dealing with these contradictions, and to put it in certain terms, what do the people who make up this leading core reach for when they come up against very acute contradictions? Do they recognize the need and act on the need to wage a fierce struggle against sp spontaneity in dealing with real-world contradictions that can actually acute that can acutely pose themselves, including um, in the con in the, to the extent of posing the question of the continued existence or not of what's been achieved so far, which again is not easy come easy go. As in, oh, we got we got state power, so let's just let it go easily because we're running into all these problems. You know, so anyway, I just kind of wanted to point to there. This is a tremendous contradiction that, you know, a lot of work has been done. And in a practical way, we're working on this right now in applying this new communism to precisely to be transformed, to be working on that, the relationship between the leadership and the masses of people who need to increasingly come to know and understand and change the world. So right. <laughs> this is, um, you know. What I'm just laughing. Yeah. She said she needs the mic. She wants to be fine. Oh, she wants to be fine. Okay. <laughs> um, I so I really appreciate that. I I really appreciate that this problem is acknowledged as a like important one, and there are people like Baba Vikian is um uh, is dealing with this problem. But I still worry that you know um during the struggle the the elite kind of becomes the one way, it's not a two way, it's not a two way path. The elite determines where the masses go and the masses have no power or say over the, the, over the elite. And also like they are, they are truly, they, they are like, you know, that's about and like the mass, and like the mass debates, um, mass political debates. And, um, but it seems that, it seems that, um, the conclusion is already drawn. Um, so the debate. Um, so. So. Take your time. Yes. Thank you. So. Um, like you know, people are told to memorize certain portions of, of what Mao said, and um, they dare not say no because otherwise they are the counter revolution and they are the enemy of the revolution and all that and. There are debates, but how does the debate actually reach up and get become a decider of where the elites will take the rev the direction you know of the revolution? Where what mechanism are there for for the results of those political debates to really have have a say and have power over elite? That's my question. Well, um, you know. Um this is a question that a v you know uh, you know um, our friend here read an excerpt and huh Nina, Nina okay uh, Nina read an excerpt from a Vikian on this this is 
you know, this is a question that has, that 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 Avakian has been addressing. You know, this relationship between vanguard leadership and bringing forth, you know, the initiative of the masses, um, and he has, you know, re envisioned the dictatorship of the proletariat. He has spoken of, you know, a, a phrase that he's used to describe, you know, this new vision. Of, not the totality of it, but an important element of it is what he calls solid core with a lot of elasticity. And what that means is that you need a solid core. You need, uh, a, 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 you know, a, you need this communist leadership, revolutionary communist leadership in the new society, you know, to lead this process forward, right? Because it's an incredibly complex. What are we? We're 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 trying to move society, you know, and, and you know. In a, in, a, in a certain direction towards overcoming exploitation and oppression, to be doing this, and Avakian has been emphasizing, you know, as part of an international process, as part of an international process, because, you know, it is a world capitalist imperialist system, a global system of domination and exploitation, and communism can only exist on a world scale. This is, you know, but the revolutions that have been made have been made in a world that's still dominated by imperialism and that's posed problems right but avakian has said that you know in 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 the in in and this is captured in the constitution for the new socialist republic in north america this solid core with a lot of elasticity means that you need this leadership you know that's firmly grounded on you know what the goals you know of what the goals are and is you know giving you know, direction, you know, to this struggle. And and you don't want to lose state power, right? But as I said in the talk, you want to ensure that that state power is worth holding on to. And you have to have, on the basis of, you know, this kind of leadership and society moving in a certain direction, you have to have maximum elasticity, as he calls it, on the basis of this solid core. In other words, you have to have incredible debate, dissent, experimentation, because getting to communism, you know, that's going to, you know, that's going to require new discovery. You know, how we're going to actually get there, the kinds of struggles. We know we have to overcome, you know, capitalism and all its manifestations, right? But you have to have a society where people, you know, have the air to breathe and can experiment and go in different directions within within the socialist society, you know, and, you know, this is something that, you know, that the, the Constitution put, you know, is sort of giving institutional expression to. So, you know, this solid core with a lot of elasticity, you know, this is, you know, one aspect of what, you know, of, you know, of how the new communism, a very important one, and the, and the, and the very important role of dissent, you know, an intellectual and cultural ferment as part of that elasticity in the new society. So, and, and, and you want a situation, you want to be waging struggle, you want to be creating institutions that enable the masses of people to understand the workings of society, where you're trying to go, and to be contributing to that, and to be taking ever greater responsibility for the transformations of society. And that's going to, you know, and there'll be new experimental organs of power. And, you know, these are all part of what, what the new communism sort of is the framework to do. So, you know, I, I just think that the question that you're posing is a real contradiction. But it's not going to be solved by eliminating leadership or you know say it's all let the masses decide well if you if you leave it to let the masses decide i promise you bourgeois forces will be helping them very strongly to make those decisions you know we don't live in a world in which there's only the the good people you know and you know and the masses are themselves divided you know into different sections of people that are more committed less committed backward you know these you know these are you know this is the reality that you know that exists and as long as society is divided into classes there'll be different programs and forces and outlooks that will be contending with each other and there's no pure mass you know that comes you know I'm joking you know that in other words pure worker or peasant right one of the problems of the cultural revolution was 
you know that and I, you know you were touching on this this idea of I, as if I heard you right right a bloodline is that what you were I mean yeah, birth, yeah this was a problem where you know if you come from a peasant or worker background you're you're good and you will naturally gravitate to revolution if you come from a more privileged you know a professional or intellectual or artistic background then you're you're a pro you could be a problem you know what I'm saying but Mao is, Mao, that was a problem in the Cultural Revolution. And Avakian has gone, has, has actually, I'm just going to say, has, has identified that as a serious problem, what he, what's called the reification of the proletariat. That is, that this idea that, that truth resides in the bosom of peasants and workers, that they will know and they will necessarily go in the right direction. No, you know, the kind of struggle, criticism, that has to be directed at everybody. I don't mean like, you know, you, you, you can't go have a lunch because you're going to be criticized for whatever. I'm just saying that we have to, all of us have to be, you know, transforming our thinking and our outlook. And there was a problem in the Cultural Revolution in which, you know, if you came from a good class background, you know, you were kind of seen as like better, you know, and, and the point is to enable the masses of people to actually understand the world as it is and the pathways for change and to, and to go up against, you know, all the obstacles that stand in the way of bringing about this world. That requires leadership and, and, and everyone needs to Everyone needs to be struggled with, you know, to get at the truth of things. And, and, and this was a problem, you know, in the Cultural Revolution, this reification of the, of the, of the, of the peasants. And, and now that was, Mao was, you know, it was, you know, at, at a, Mao was also emphasizing, and this is why it's contradictory, he, Mao said that political and ideological line are decisive. That's an important principle of the cultural revolution that 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 it's it's not what your class background is but your but the political and ideological perspectives that you're fighting for that you know that 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 you are you know part of you know I mean this is you know what I'm that's what what how you have to judge people not you know if a worker said it it's good no what's the political and ideological you know, outlook and perspective and, you know, program, right? That line, right? Where will it lead? To liberation? Or is it going to lead back to, you know, widening those inequalities between town and country, between, you know, between men and women, between different nationalities, right? So that's what has to be analyzed. And it can't be prejudged based on your social, gender, or class background you know this is an important leap and rupture embodied in the new communism okay so this is a weakness i mean in you know of the cultural revolution so these are all the kinds of things that avakian you know has summed up and that we have to you know that we have to be applying you know as we build this movement you know for revolution you know and everyone let me just say this everyone is capable of learning and taking up the scientific method and approach. Avikian has emphasized that. This is not, you know, this is not just for the, for the handful, right? On the other hand, the work of intellectuals and scientists, you know, this is very important, you know, critical, you know, to the kind of society you want to live in where new new discovery new knowledge and 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 we're not going to get to a communist world without you know this kind of ferment you know the, these new discoveries these insights you know and 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 this is you know what's before us right now for instance just I'm going to stop now we cannot solve the environmental crisis right simply by saying let's leave it to the community right. let's they know best well, there's good knowledge in the, you know, I've heard, you know, there's important knowledge in the communities, right, that are impacted by warming, by, you know, by, by, by dumping of waste, et cetera, right? But, you know, you need to combine, this is like where we can, we need to combine the expertise of climate scientists with the direct experience of people in the, in the neighborhoods. You know, this is what we'll be able to do. You need to develop technology, you know, that's suitable to, to, to addressing these problems. So you need people that know technology. This is what we can do. But it has to be led, 
you know, in a way, not just to solve that problem, but in a way that enables people to understand what the problem is and how it fits into the larger matrix of changing the world for the betterment of humanity. So these are all the kinds of big challenges, you know, that we confront. You know, I'm just laughing. I, I, I just want to, you know, about your, um, I just was thinking about your question about on the job and with your, you know, your fellow workers. You know, there's a, um, you know, you know, there was a book that was written by David Graeber, you know, who's an anarchist, but, you know, yeah. we can learn from him. He wrote a book called Shit Jobs, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and, you know, and, you know, and it turns out, you know, I mean, he had his statistics and I've seen other people, you know, but basically, like, one out of five people think what they're doing is socially useless, yeah. okay? <laughs> one out of five people think what they're doing is socially... I'm going to write on this. Don't worry. But 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 uh, but 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 you know. But that's I'm saying you can have some good discussion. But people want to do something that's meaningful and purposeful, yeah. right? And that's what revolution, what the the new communism can 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 enable that to happen, right? Will there still be quote unquote some shit jobs? Yes. I mean, look, you know, and you're going to have to transform things, right? But that's another point that it doesn't all come down to your immediate job and experience you know that you live in a world and we want to be transforming that whole world and people have to see everything that they're doing you know in the context of contributing you know to the betterment of humanity the emancipation of humanity and we have to be breaking down the division of labor right we want to eliminate i'll tell you one thing in according to the data i've seen one out of eight people in the U.S. labor force is a manager, right? Okay, so, you know, now that includes people that work as managers at McDonald's, and that is a shit low-level job, but they are technically classified as, you know what I'm saying, the people that run that. But what I'm saying is that, that we're going to transform the economy radically. You don't, that's a socially wasteful work. One out of eight people doing manager, and a lot of that management is to, to, to squeeze more, right? To squeeze more profit out of people, to keep people happy when they're really profoundly unhappy. You know what I mean? Human relations, you know. So, 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 you know, I'm just saying this gets at the, the totality of the, you know, what we're confronting. Why did I say that? Because, because, it, this is about transforming everything, right? And and we have to be thinking about all these kinds of questions, right? And people who are managers today can make important contributions in a new society, lending their expertise, right? But they're going to be changing what they're doing, and everyone's going to be, you know, we're going to be changing how people, you know, think and feel, not by again, forcing them to think and feel this way, but by opening, you know, great debate in society. And, and this is, you know, what Avakian is, you know, talking about, you know, that you can't get to communism by, you know, you know, through coercion and force. You have to do it, you know, through this kind of, you know, everything we've been talking about, okay? So I don't want to, but that, so that solid core with a lot of elasticity you know, speaks to, you know, one way is speaking to one of the, these, contra you know, this contradiction, not in total, to what you're talking. Yeah. yeah. So my question still remains. So you just addressed the grassroots uh, organization aspect, but I still have the problem about um, decision making and uh, the core that you talked about. So, you know, during the corporate revolution, Mao was, you know, um, was at some point releasing power, but at some point uh, getting, uh, getting power into his hands again. And he, he was wavering on that, but he, um, but in my you know observation, uh, throughout the last seven or eight years of the Cultural Revolution, if that you can call it as the revolution, uh, Cultural Revolution as such, they are, um, um, he is still he is still the decision maker, and he is, um, he, and he made mistakes. He he he's a decision maker, and he thought that like you know in the communes, there has to be party leadership, and party leadership, this core leadership is crucial, and he was part of that core, but he made mistakes. So how can we make sure that, for example, Baba Viking or future leadership, when when they make mistakes, what can we do as masses? And like, um, does, and also the scientific means a priori correct? That's, that's my question. 
Well, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, you're going to speak. Yeah. Mike. Mike. Molly. Uh, Mike, check. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to be simplistic about it, but there is no guarantee. You know, there. this is part of the process. And this process starts now. And this is, right now, is what we're doing in terms of training what what Raymond was saying in terms of training people to become scientists, to actually open up these questions, to have what is called uh, enriched what is to be doneism, is again a, a contribution of the new communism, where it is in, it's what is to be done that Lenin developed, which is exactly the leadership that's required, that the understanding that the spontaneous pulls of the society that you live in will um, take you, you know, if you live in a capitalist society, they're, they're going to take you to the limits of, you know, trying to perfect within that society, as opposed to providing revolutionary leadership that, you know, to actually make a revolution. But the, the, the enriched part is putting the problems of society before people, of actually, we don't know, you know, we don't know how to, uh, actually bring forward the thousands of people needed now for revolutionary force. That's not the question I'm asking. It, well, I'm saying that we have to bring, we have to train people to grapple with the big questions of society. There is no, I mean, it seems like what you're asking, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, is that there's, a, you're, that you're asking for how do, how do we guarantee that these problems are not uh, no, that's continued. That's not the question. That's not the question. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Then she was talking about Baba Vakian. The, the question is, if the leadership errs, what can we do? The leadership what? Errs. 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 What mechanism or institution are there in place for the masses to make their voices heard? Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess I thought it was... Right. Well, that's the yeah. There's. Um, we'll talk. You had your hand up. Okay. I think this takes us back to what you talked about about solid core with a lot of elasticity, and that is opening up leadership that is working to take society along the path towards communism and understanding that that has to encompass unleashing the greatest discussion, debate, bringing forward people to criticize, and not pushing aside criticism if it comes from a source that is maybe mostly wrong. You actually have to look at it for what is the content of the criticism, not the source. And one thing I'll say about Avakian, I, am I going in and out here? Yeah. Well, now I think okay. okay. Yeah. All right. One thing I'll say about Avakian, if you actually look through his work, he footnotes where he gets stuff from, and some of them are where you would expect a revolutionary communist to get their stuff from. They're from previous communist leaders, but some of them are from, you know, like military, imperialist military people and other forces who we overall oppose the conclusions that they come to, but they have some truth in what they're putting forward. And Avakian has shown an ability to learn from that truth. And that's something that we all have to learn. We all have to learn that like, this discussion and debate needs to be thrown open. We need to engage in it, not from a thing of, well, I can't say this because I'll get criticized. The point is, if it's correct, you need to say it anyway, whether or not somebody might criticize you, because we have to get to the truth. The way to transform society in the direction desired is to get the most thorough understanding of the reality of that society. And we need to unleash all of the debate and discussion and controversy that we can in order to get there. And then the other thing that Avakian speaks to 
is the need to go to the brink of being drawn and quartered. In other words, we can't hold it close to the chest and try to be safe. We got to really unleash the discussion and struggle throughout society, let it get wild and woolly, and then work to bring out of that a correct synthesis for what reality actually is and how it can be transformed. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then I'm gonna, okay, do you ever? Uh, mic, the mic, please. The mic. The, the, news, the, the party newspapers, so the party newspapers said the same, said when the uh, Communist Party will take power, there will be like a lot of like press freedom and freedom of speech, etc. And also uh, Mao himself actually, before the, this is before the Communist Revolution, there was a period where he advocated or he pretended to advocate for the 100 flowers mm -hmm. blooming, blossoming movement and a lot of people spoke up and then they get, um, they, they, they were thrown into prison for being like right wing, you know, rightists. Um, so I, I think like promising and saying we're going to do this, we're going to do that is somewhat empty. So I, I want to say something, say some, I want to say something that is like, you know, I guess institutionalized or like something more substantive than saying we're going to have freedom Maybe institution is the right, wrong word, but some kind of mechanism saying we are going to definitely allow people to have freedom of the press, for example. Okay, wait, um, I see. Okay. Okay, um, you're, I want to say, look, I just want to. I wanted to speak to this a little bit, because I think it has. The, the, the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic you know, protects the rights of the people, okay? The right of the people to express themselves, right? Even opposition to socialism, it lays this out, right? It, 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 it states very clearly that, that there will be the ability of people to broadcast their views for independent media to exist in the new socialist society internet media, um, and, um, and this will include, you know, voices that are opposed to socialism. I just want to make this very clear. This is an important aspect of what the new social, what the constitution of the new socialist republic is saying, because you, this is what I was getting at at the end of my speech, that you have to have contestation in society you know, over where it's headed, you know, is this desirable? Are we doing things right? Is socialism actually the answer to these problems, right? This has to be part of the discourse, and it'll be part of the struggle, and it's going to give rise, you know, not just to, like, ideas that are battled out, you know, in the press, but there will be movements, you know, for instance, you know, the Occupy movement, in, in the U.S., they will be occupied in, in the vision of the, of the Constitution. They're going to be occupy-like movements, you know, where people, or let's take the environment, you know, they're going to be people that say, well, no, we, we have to, you know, we're not going fast enough. We're going to, you know, organize against what you're doing, you know, not now. And, and the Constitution is saying, yes, people can be organizing. People can, you know, not just different contending programs, but people will have the right you know, to, 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 to organize, right? They cannot destroy the, pro you know, this, the state socialist property and the functioning of the economy. They can't carry out acts of sabotage, be murdering people they don't like over the environmental question. But it's going to be a very, you know, that's going to be the, you know, you're going to have these kinds of, you know, do people know what I'm referring to about Occupy, you know, Occupy Wall Street, right? Well, you know, we, this is what Carl was saying about going to the brink of being drawn in court. You're going to have movements like that. Even what happened in Egypt in 2011, you know, that scale of protest, you have to have that. You know, you have to, I'm not saying you have to script that to happen, but you have to allow for and enable, allow for and assure people that they will have that capacity to, to express and organize themselves in the new socialist society. But you cannot allow that to become 
counter-revolution. You can't lose power. But, you know, not every... This is, you know, why the example you're giving about the, um, the uh, you know, let a, you know, the flowers contend and bloom and, you know, 100 flowers campaign, you know, that got complex because there were counter-revolutionaries that were taking advantage of it, but it was shut down too early and there were false accusations. This is something, you know, we can, you know, we can talk about. You can't have this, one of the problems of the Cultural Revolution, this, you know, was people got labeled very, you know, very quickly and, 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 and that became kind of a, uh, a scarlet letter, you know, that novel, you know, you kind of, you walk around, I'm, you know, I did wrong, you know, now that was not Mao's approach to this, but this happened, right? And you, you know, so, you know, when you let things go in, you know, in the kind of direction we're talking about, you're going to have very bad currents too. And bad tendency, you know, it's not like, oh, that's all good. Let the, you know, the, you're going to have to, this is why you need that kind of leadership. And as far as Baba Vakio, look, he is, you know, he is, as I, as I said, he's rescued He's rescued communism after the defeat, you know, and of of the first stage. He's rescued it, and not only rescued it, keeping it, you know, keeping, you know, keeping it sort of as it were. He's 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 taken communism to a whole other place, and this allows us to make the kind of revolution that needs to be made. And Bob Avakian would be the first to tell you that you have to subject his, you know, you know what he's bringing forth. Subject that. To the scientific method of scrutinizing, does this does is is this vision of a socialist society does that conform? Does that correspond to what's needed to make the leap to communism? I'm going to say something about this in just a second about socialism and communism. But you have to subject, you know, that 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 he has made this incredible breakthrough, as I said, for humanity. Right? We, you know, this gives hope on a scientific basis. We can now get to communism with the new communism. We couldn't, even with the best of the cultural revolution. All right, that's a strong statement, right? But, you know, we are where we are with the new communism because we, there was a new stage that opened up, you know, you know, whole new prospects for humanity. But now Avakian has subjected that, you know, to, 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 to deep... And sweeping interrogation, and then you have to say, "Is this right? Is this a correct summation of that first stage? Is this framework for the new stage of communism? Is that correct? Is it speaking to the kinds of contradictions that we have to navigate and surmount?" So it's subject to the scientific method and approach, but he's done this work, right? It corresponds to what is needed to. Na to go from the bourgeois epoch to the communist epoch. What he's brought forward, it provides the basis, the understanding, but not as a static, fixed set of ideas, but the method and approach, because we're going to be facing all kinds of new problems and contradictions. I mean, we may be making this revolution, you know, on the ashes of, you know, of, war i don't you know i'm just saying you know and and it's gonna you know there's all i'm not predicting anything right but is this the method and approach and the framework you know to deal with the problems we know we have to deal with and with new problems that we're going to be confronting now someone in the audience asked well social you know could you you know what what you know socialism and communism and i spoke you know briefly about this but look socialism is three things it's a new form of political power in which the formerly oppressed and exploited in alliance with the broad, you know, majority of society, professionals and others, right? A new form of political power in, in which you are, you know, empowering people, as I said, you know, to take responsibility, you know, for the direction of society in which you're able to put down counter-revolution you know, in other words, you need state power because bourgeois forces, old and new, international, are going to try to strangle you, as they've done in previous revolutions. So you need a, a state power, but you need to protect the rights of the people. You need a military, you know, you need a, a police, a, but a radically different kind of military, right? You need to coordinate, 
you know, as I said, the functioning of society. So it's a new form of state power. It's also, it's a new economic system in which you've replaced production for profit and private ownership with social ownership and production for social need and in which, you know, the economy is serving not just the needs of the people but working to overcome all these great social differences that I was addressing between mental and manual labor, men and women, you know, the, that the economy and it has to be the new socialist economy and this is a whole new understanding has to be, you know, has to be uh, you know, protecting and repairing the planet. Okay, that's and 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 the new economy has to be promo has to be contributing to the advance of the world revolution. But most importantly, socialism is a transition to communism, a society and world in which you have overcome exploitation and oppression, material scarcity, antagonistic social conflict, and what Avakian has you know you know, has, has emphasized, and this was something that Mao, you know, you know, popularized in the Cultural Revolution, but Avakian has taken this to a new place of understanding, is that is is what is is communism is the overcoming, the abolishing of what Marx originally called the four alls. Okay? And this is a, a useful way to understand what communism is. It's putting in it's overcoming you know, the, the, the division of society into classes, all class, what Marx called, you know, the division of society, the general division of society into classes. So overcoming, you know, those class divisions. It's overcoming all the systems of production on which class division rests. In other words, the, cap, we, the, the, cap, the classes you know, the social classes in modern capitalist imperialist society, you know, the capitalist imperialists, the middle classes, the pro, the workers, the pro, these classes, right, all are grounded in the capitalist system of production, an exploitative system of production. So it's a, a getting beyond the division of society and the world into classes, beyond all systems of production on which such class division rests, overcoming all institutions and social relations which correspond to that system of production you know the the relations you know the dominant you know the relations you know the of racism you know white supremacy you know of male supremacy and all the institutions of control you know that exist in this exploiters getting beyond all those kinds of institutions and relations and overcoming and getting beyond all the ideas and values and cultural phenomena that flow from and serve all of what I've, the institutions, you know, that reinforce the production relations which undergird the division of society into classes. So communism is, is a world where we've gotten beyond that, where people are consciously and voluntarily changing society and changing themselves in which each is contributing all that they can to the betterment of society and receiving from society what they need and the differences in what people's needs are but this is all part of the excitement <laughs> you know what it means to be in a society you know in which you've overcome you know these four alls all those things right and socialism is the transition to getting there, the, the 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 transformation and the struggles, and you know, and this is you know, and 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 the the new communism has you know, I'm not going to talk more on this, but the new communism, you know, has made this has 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 brought forth a new scientific you know understanding of this, and again, what it's going to take to get the, to 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 make and navigate that transition on a world scale to a communist world. So, you know, this is, um, you know, it's all part of what people should learn more about. But most importantly, you know, in learning about becoming part of this struggle for a whole new world, okay? And I think that all of the questions that have been brought up, I mean, my dear friend, all the accursed questions of the leadership, the mass, the relationship between the leadership and the masses, between 
administration and bureaucracy and 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 empowering people you know to you know to change themselves in the world these are like critical questions in making revolution and understanding why we make revolution and how we're going to do it and you know i just really encourage people to read the constitution come back to revolution books uh, the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America, and and really let's uh, let's continue this discussion, right, and this um, debate, because it has everything to do with the future of humanity and the planet. And I want to thank everyone for coming out, and we can maybe have some informal get together. I want everyone. Uh, you know, to look around you, look at this bookstore, look at the bookshelves, look at the people who are sitting beside you, and think and say to yourself, wow, what a great thing it is to have a bookstore like this. <laughs>